Hello and welcome to Consider the Source Conversations. I'm Jennifer Rhodes and I'm thrilled to be joined today by Assistant Professor of English at Universidad Católica de Chile, Francisca Fokuyumjan, uh, who will be talking to us about Shakespeare. Uh, Francisca, welcome. I'm so thrilled to be chatting with you. Hey, thank you so much, Jenny. Thank you for having me. <laughs> it's my pleasure. Um, I have to say at the outset that I love Shakespeare, but I am I remain con completely intimidated by Shakespeare. I keep thinking that at some point in my life, I will stop being intimidated by Shakespeare, but that hasn't been the case uh, so far. Um, and every time I read a work for the first time or for the uh, dozenth time, um, I'm, I'm dazzled by it. And also uh, it seems to be opening a gateway into a world with so many possibilities that I find both very exciting and a bit daunting. So I'm thrilled to be talking to someone who is already immersed in that world about uh, all of the possibilities and, um, and, uh, and histories that are embedded in Midsummer Night's Dream. Thank you so much. I've been um, teaching Shakespeare for, I think, something like nine years now. Um, and I, I think I approach Shakespeare um, with enthusiasm. I'm not going to say I'm the most um, scholarly person on Shakespeare, but I do love him. Um, love him in a way, I guess, in which I also love opera, that it's, that it's where I find it both incredibly moving, very beautiful, but also quite funny at times. And that sort of melodramatic element that I think we can find um, quite visibly in Midsummer Night's Dream is something that attracts me, I think, to both Shakespeare and opera as a, a sort of genre in itself. I also think I'm drawn to Shakespeare because I see my students um, creating a sort of bridge into um, culture in general so that they can approach, um, I don't know, memes or, or um, discussions on online in social media, for instance, through some through a writer that is so, so very popular, um, which perhaps doesn't happen with, with other writers. So if you quote any Shakespeare, people from all over the world are gonna be able to sort of discuss the text or make fun of the text um, because, they, because they know the quotations and so on. Um, and Midsummer Night's Dream is such a popular play. It's, it's one of those that everyone knows. Um, I don't often teach it in my classroom because so many students have already read it in, in high school, right? Which I think is the same in the US. It was junior high for me, honestly. We did it as a play in my seventh grade, uh, my seventh grade theater class. And I don't think I had read the whole thing. I'd read parts of it many times, but I don't think I had read the whole thing um, until, until actually quite recently and was shocked by how much they gave us, how much we missed. Um, I felt like it was a play I knew. Uh, it is, it, it, and, and I discovered that I knew very little, um, but it was, it was incredible to rediscover something that I thought I knew um, in it, um, where I think I would have recognized certain parts of it as familiar, but not known them in their sort of depths. And I think the same happens here with the added challenge of the translation. So people will go to, I would say, either Midsummer Night's Dream or Romeo and Juliet, which is the other really popular mm -hmm. one in high school, via a translation that I think maybe misses or, or, or skips over some of the more um, problematic aspects of the play. And I'm referring to Romeo and Juliet um, because these were plays, these were two plays that were based on Ovid's uh, Pyramus and Thisbe in mm -hmm. the Metamorphosis. And they are, and Romeo and Juliet is sort of the tragic version of Midsummer Night's Dream. And apparently Shakespeare was writing these at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, so it's quite interesting that he takes one into the comic realm and another one and what would happen if everything went wrong. So I think that's, that's quite fascinating. And we can talk a little bit about the darker aspects or the more problematic aspects of the play um, later maybe. Sure, yeah. I mean, on the, on the subject of background, I know with Shakespeare, there's basically endless endless information that, that is to be found on um, you know, research into all the different dimensions. Are there elements of the background of this sort of basic elements that are especially interesting in thinking about meaning the background or the reception of it? 
I think, um, well, it's written 1595, possibly for an aristocratic wedding, although there is no evidence that that's the case, except for maybe more people in the cast, which would suggest um, more resources. Mm -hmm. Um, it was written under Queen Elizabeth, which is significant because um, the, it allows for the possibility of the supernatural as something benign. Mm -hmm. um, there is actually a, a homage to, to Queen Elizabeth in Act 2, Scene 1, which apparently doesn't make it into the opera but it's, it's still, I think, quite fascinating, which is the, the scene, act two, scene one, when Oberon um, sends Puck to find the little flower, um, which says, that very time I saw, but thou couldst not, flying between the cold moon and the earth, Cupid all armed, a certain aim he took at a fair vestal, throned by the west, and loosed his love shaft smartly from his bow, as it should pierce a hundred thousand hearts. But I might see young Cupid's fiery shaft quenched in the chaste beams of the watery moon and the imperial votress passed on in maiden meditation, fancy free. So that's Queen Elizabeth who is not, um, who is not struck by Cupid, who is presumably the virgin queen who, who none can, no man can, can have. Now, and I mentioned that this is specifically written for Queen Elizabeth because uh, James I, who's gonna, um, who's gonna be um, Shakespeare's patron uh, starting 1603, James I doesn't like fairies, doesn't like the supernatural, doesn't like demons. And he considers fairies as devilish um, as he writes in his treatise on demonology. He, he actually wrote a treatise on like, demons and witches are real and they're evil and you should not and you should avoid them right um, and Shakespeare is quite adept at sort of um, managing to stay out of jail which which was which was a, a big thing because not everyone did it right a lot of people sort of ended up in jail a lot of writers because they did something to upset the authorities and I think one of the reasons that Shakespeare is still so relevant is that there are so many silences in the text, which you can read sort of in different ways and which affect performance. Mm -hmm. And one of the really cool things I think about Midsummer Night's Dream in particular is that it has been incredibly popular and, and been staged so many thousands of times that we should now, when we look at the text, I don't think we can really um, set it apart from its performance history. There's just so much richness in how it has been adapted um, into different musical versions, especially mm -hmm. staged, filmed, um, that, I, that all of these things have to be taken into consideration when you read the play. Mm -hmm. um, are there uh, versions? I uh, I was thinking um, that I'm oh, continually surprised at, at uh, how many operas thirty nine based yep. on um, based on the play. Are there are there versions that that you find particularly prominent that are that are kind of attached to um, to the work? I saw recently there's a very uh, brief clip of Patrick Stewart talking about how. Um, when he played different roles in this, including Oberon, he heard the Britain, uh, he heard the Britain version in his head as he spoke the lines, which was quite, I thought, magical. Um, other versions that stand out for you in your, um, your experience with, uh, with a variety of productions? What I find fascinating, I think, about uh, Midsummer Night's Dream in particular is that because it has either, what is it, nine characters, nine lead roles. So there's not this, you can say there's nine lead roles or no lead roles, right? Mm -hmm. um, so you can take, you can focus in productions and adaptations on either the fairy aspect of it, or you can look at the lovers and perhaps the Ath Athenian rulers, or you can take, or you can really focus on the mechanicals. And I think um, Bottom, one of the, the main mechanical, um, has taken up a lot of, of, of space in productions. There was even um, re kind of recently after it was, um, after Shakespeare died, I think, there was a 
a text called The Merry Conceited Humors of Bottom the Weaver. So it's, it sort of takes up that dream that Bottom would like to, to write and, and it's published, right? It's not part of um, the Shakespearean canon necessarily, but it's, it's, it illustrates, I think, how much uh, Bottom and the fairies and all of the different characters um, captured the imagination of audiences and authors. There's Henry Purcell's opera, The Fairy Queen, that's 1692, which began the tradition of spectacle um, with which Midsummer Night's Dream is so linked. Um, and sort of essentially starting from Purcell, you have this, uh, this introduction of music and spectacle in Midsummer Night's Dream that often does away with um, maybe an ex the, the words themselves. Um, the, the mask, the, the, the Bergamask dance, dance is also something that, it, that comes up. Then um, you have Mendelssohn's Overture, which he wrote in 1826, and then he added incidental music to that. Um, a little bit later, that incidental music includes the, the wedding march. And if you see productions, filmic productions, especially of um, Midsummer Night's Dream, you'll often see in the, in the final wedding scene, Mendelssohn's music coming in. All of the ballets, or most of the ballets, including a Balanchine version, use Mendelssohn's music um, to create um, the, the play, to adapt the play. So really the, the musical element is, is now very much married to our, our understanding or our remembrance even of, of Midsummer Night's Dream. Um, during, during Romanticism, of course, it was the fairies rule, right? And you had that, that idea of spectacle, think of sort of Victorian um, accumulation of things on stage. So you had lots of fairies. It, you needed a high budget, right, to stage Midsummer Night's Dream. There was one production that included sort of live rabbits, why not? Um, and all twinkling lights, you know, all sorts of different things, that, whatever you can add. Um, to the stage was there. And the other really famous production, which I think sort of changed the, the paradigm of Midsummer Night's Dream productions is um, in the 70s, Peter Brook's production of Midsummer Night's Dream, which sort of takes up um, Jan Kot's, um, he has a book, Jan Kot was a Polish uh, author and uh, writer and theorist and he wrote this book called Shakespeare Our Contemporary and it was very influential because it brought out the sort of darker aspects of Shakespeare that we that we usually don't that or ha that had up to then not been considered as strongly. In his chapter on Midsummer Night's Dream, Jan Kott um, discusses sort of the animal sexuality, animal eroticism that is really present, sort of if you think of Titania and Bottom with the ass's head. Um, and, and, and there's that very strange exchange between um, Helena and Demetrius where she says, I'd be your spaniel. Mm -hmm. um, all of that sort of darker sexual um, elements are brought to light in Jan Kott's essay. And Peter Brook picks up on that. And instead of staging a sort of Victorian uh, vision with, over, with an overflowing stage, he pairs it down and uses a white box, which has, which really doesn't have anything. It's just a white box that is illuminated. So he does away with the Midsummer Night. He does away with night. So everything is exposed. Mm -hmm. And he does sort of, he uses um, actors on stilts and trapezes. And it's very sort of circus-like. I've only watched clips of this because apparently the original uh, footage was lost. And you have um, Titania sort of living in her bower, sort of a large pink feather in the sky. Um, and it was just, it's very sort of physical and very funny and very, and it brings to light these grotesque elements that, that Jan Kott was talking about. And that's sort of another 
another way to look at Midsummer Night's Dream is instead focusing on the language and how the language brings to light, um, creates the world. And there's, there's that notion in Midsummer Night's Dream of the, of the power of imagination that I think is quite relevant, especially given the, the staging devices in, in early modern England, right? Where you had sort of nothing on stage or basically nothing on stage, it was a bare stage. Um, and you had maybe a few props, like a bucket or a something. Yeah. A cup. And then you had um, the words, the words creating this word. And I think Midsummer Night's Dream is about that luscious language, the, 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 the section, the area that does translate um, to the opera. And that I think is one of the most famous areas in the opera is Oberon's, um, <laughs> I know a bank, let me see if I, I find it here. So this is act two, scene two, line uh, 249 in the play. And Oberon tells Puck, I know a bank where the wild thyme blows, where ox lips and the nodding violet grows, quite over canopied with luscious woodbine, with sweet musk roses and with eglantine. There sleeps Titania some time of the night lulled in these flowers with dances and delight. And there the snake throws her enameled skin, weed white enough to wrap a fairy in. So it's, it's just that the language is so glorious. It's so, so delightful, I think so rich that it does create that, that bower, right? Where, where Titania presumably sleeps. Now, um, that might have been also part of the staging. The, the admiral's men who were the um, rival company to the, the chamberlain's men where Shakespeare acted um, included, they had sort of a moss bank. So I guess patch of grass, possibly artificial with flowers or something, um, which would have created the, the, the bed of uh, Titania, but everything else you have to create with the imagination. Mm -hmm. And this play is about how much you can, you can rely or ask your audience to imagine. The, the mechanical scene um, is endearing and sympathetic and it, and it works not because they're very good, <laughs> actually quite the contrary, but because they're, there is within, they ask, right, that the audience imagine what this might be like. And even, and that scene is quite lovely because when the mechanicals finally get to do their performance, the aristocrats, right, the nobles um, at court are initially very skeptical um, and they make fun of the mechanicals, but increasingly you get a sense of how there's a sense of sympathy and of, I think even Hippolyta says that, that they she feels moved by what is going on, even though it's quite ridiculous. Um, they manage these performers with their effort and their there's a sense of dignity in them trying to, to get this together that makes it very sympathetic. And it does have to do with the imagination. Indeed, um, Theseus at the very end offers, um, he says that imagination is sort of nonsense. I and mean, more than nonsense, he's afraid of imagination. I'm talking about act five, scene one, where Theseus says, lovers and madmen have such seething brains, such shaping fantasies that apprehend more than cool reason ever comprehend, comprehends. The lunatic, the lover and the poet are of imagination all compact. One sees more devils than vast hell can hold, that is a madman. The lover, all is frantic, sees Helen's beauty in a brow of Egypt. The poet's eye in a fine frenzy rolling doth glance from heaven to earth, from earth to heaven. And as imagination bodies forth, the form of things unknown, the poet's pen turns them to shapes and gives to airy nothing a local habitation and a name. That's, it's such a lovely passage, which is, it's a little ironic because he's also a figure of mythology. So he has been created as well by, by fantasy, but it, it suggests a sense of how he is afraid that, that this imagination can turn a little bit later. He says, 
in the night imagining some fear, how easy is a bush supposed to bear so that we can get carried away by these, these dreams, which I think can also be turned to nightmares, um, which is also something I think quite interesting. Yes, I mean, it's so interesting to think about the different ways in which um, kind of storytelling is creating multiple levels of the universe, right? That let's that it's like on the level of the narrative, on the level of the writer, on the level of the production concept, on the level of the adaptation yeah. concept. I mean, it's amazing this kind of like, uh, chain or even a blossoming maybe it feels more like branching rather than um, rather than something linear um, these kinds of branching adaptations and all of that um, is already embedded in in even just like the 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 I wonder if you might talk a bit about form um, and uh, the 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 ways in which form engages with that same sort of process of imagination process of creation um, that's that's a really good question. This this is um, sort of one of the earlier comedies by by Shakespeare. Um, I mean, he knew his trade by now, but he is, I think, keen to display all of his poetic skills. And it's and it's quite interesting that a lot of the play is in verse. Now Shakespeare plays around with with verse and prose, often giving to sort of the the. The characters who have a higher social status, they speak usually in verse. And when you have servants or, or tradespeople or mechanicals in this case, they'll often be talking in um, prose. People who are drunk often also sort of go drunk or mad, they'll go into, into prose as well. But it, here in Shakespeare, um, there's here in Midsummer Night's Dream Story, there's there's an sort of an excessive use of specifically rhyme so that Shakespeare is not using iambic pentameter, I mean, blank verse as much. There's iambic pentameter, but it's always not always, but very much rhymed, including the lovers, which is a little odd. Um, and you could say that because they're they're mad, they participate in this, the madness or the lunacy of the poet, the madman. Uh, and the lover, right? That they that they have reached this stage where they only speak in rhyming couplets, which is sort of amazing. Um, they there is a lot of um, there's a lot of repartee riddles um, puns, right? There's even which is not quite frequent in Shakespeare. Um, an instance of or several instances actually of stichomythia, which is this Greek form um, where where one character uns answers the other but it's it's also written um, um, often in rhyme here so if you take a look at what is it act one scene one Hermia and Lysander because they love each other so much they can sort of complete each other's sentences and they create and this I mean in in Romeo and Juliet if you remember the first time Romeo and Juliet meet they create this sonnet together um, here it's it's not a sonnet but it's this um, duet right which is again which brings us back to the to the musicality of the play, which, I mean, we don't really have a lot of actual music in the play. You have the Bergamask at the end that the performers um, offer sort of a, an, an extra. Um, and there's the lullaby that the fairies sing so that Titania falls asleep. But there are all of these other elements, including verse, the ex excessive use of rhyme, that to me sounds so, so musical, that reminds you, sort of invites you to musicalize these things. Um, there's, uh, there's also at the end, um, when Theseus discovers the, discovers the, um, his hunting party discovers the sleeping lovers in the, in the forest. And before then he, he has this little, um, monologue where he's talking about how he has chosen his hounds because of their musicality, because of their howling. So that's one of the ways that he has chosen these particular hounds for hunting, which I thought was quite, I mean, it's quite lovely that you're thinking of music even, or in animals, which is again, something that comes up. Animal imagery is, is, is so present. Um, so there's the element I think of, of verse to go back to what you were asking initially, 
I think helps very much to create the magical world of the fairies, especially, right? That sort of magical atmosphere of the woods um, in which these lovers are sort of immersed. But there's also a lot of poetry, of lyricism in the prose as well, especially in, in Bottom's prose, which is supposed to be right, the sort of the grotesque, the ridiculous. But he has this really famous passage when he wakes up after having, he's right, he's lost his, his ass's head and he wakes up, doesn't really know where he is um, and tries to explain and remember what has happened to him. And he can't quite get there. And that inability, I think is very, very poignant. I'm quoting here from um, Act 4, Scene 1, line 200, almost 200. So bottom awakes and he says, when my cue comes, call me and I will answer. So that's kind of funny because he's waking up mid rehearsal, right? Um, and then he, then he's like, Peter Quince, flute, the bellows mender, right? God's my life, stolen hens and left me asleep. And then this is the part which sort of becomes, uh, so there's humor, right? When he wakes up, he doesn't know where he is. And then it gets lyrical. I have had a most rare vision. I have had a dream. Pass the wit of man to say what dream it was. Man is but an ass if we go about to expound this dream. Methought I was, there's an ellipsis there. There's no man can tell what. Methought I was and methought I had, but man is but a patched fool if he will offer to say what methought I had. The eye of man hath not heard, the ear of man hath not seen. Man's hand is not able to taste his tongue to conceive nor his ha heart to report what my dream was. I will get Peter Quince to write a ballad of this dream. It shall be called Bottom's Dream because it hath no bottom. So that, so it goes sort of jokey, poignant, jokey. Um, and, it's, and it's written in, in prose, but I think it, it, re it reveals this sort of inability because we are not, as an audience, we're not gonna be talking in rhyming couplets. We are more in this sense, I think, coming from Bottom's point of view, that you're not articulate enough to, to bring about what, what happened to me. Uh, I was in this, in this beautiful dream and I now don't know how to, how to bring it together, how to keep it with me. Um, and of course, the, the, the reference there to, to the eye of man hath not heard, the ear of man hath not seen is, is to St. Paul's epistle in 1 Corinthians. So it's, it's also a little joke uh, by a, a, a writer who is not that pious. Um, I, and I, it, it's a joke he can get away with, I think, because it's, it's, it's walking the line between um, mockery, I suppose, but because it's coming from Bottom who actually feels this as, as quite real, it becomes moving and therefore not, not ridiculous, not mocking of scripture. Um, so I think that that combination is quite lovely in terms of form. And I, Britain, um, correct me if I'm wrong, took up most of, I mean, it's all, it's all Shakespeare, right? Yeah. In the, in the There's one additional line. Um, and he says that he cut roughly half. Some of it has been rearranged somewhat as well. Um, but it's all Shakespeare. One, one of the amazing things about this as, as a fellow lover of Shakespeare and opera, you know, that, that is not always the case with, you know, uh, with Shakespearean operas. Um, but it's amazing to have it both in English and the actual text there. Um, with some cuts, but I mean, even the cuts are so um, are so interesting to think about how you you know distill a work like this into a more sort of streamlined form. What is what is present and what is um, what is what is not present in the final uh, libretto. Um, I wonder if you could think. I I I love this examination of form on all levels, and also one of the things that preoccupies me about this work is the ways in which it plays with all kinds of um, structures, including genre. Um, this is referred to as a comedy, but it seems to bend, always bend the, uh, the structures of, uh, of any form that you try to sort of uh, adapt it to. And it also seems like we see that uh, replicated in the three groups of people that we have, or uh, three groups of characters we have on stage, not all of them are people um, in, um, 
just just in all the ways in which we see both structures um, presented and then also problematized. Um, I wonder if you have thoughts along along the lines of sort of structures resisting or conforming to them, anything like that. I mean, I think on the one hand, the very the it, we we could go to the very title of the play. Midsummer Night's Dream has to do with the eve of the summer solstice, which has to do with, with rights, especially rights of fertility and, and matchmaking and creating couples and so on, which was, which was I mean, it's a, there were medieval feasts that sort of um, were continued under Queen Elizabeth, although she wasn't particular, she didn't particularly like all of these because they could sort of get out of hand. Festivals uh, have, have a lot to do with with carnival and what uh, Bakhtin calls the carnivalesque, this instance of disorder, um, of the world upside down, of um, servants becoming rulers and vice versa, of boundaries being broken, even if it's a parenthetical instance, so that the, the carnival will last for a day, say, uh, and then order will be restored. Um, there's still that, the parenthesis, I think, is, is worth something. And one can ask sort of what is left over after this parenthesis. Is order fully restored or not? And I think Shakespeare's comedies have a lot to do with, with the, the festival, the, the carnival of life. Um, that moment of upside downness, of, of rebellion, if you like, of resistance, in a sense. Um, something like, you could even think of Twelfth Night, which has nothing to do with the title. So the, the, the title of Twelfth Night has nothing to do with it, but there's a sense there of carnival of, as well. And Twelfth Night is a more mature comedy, so it will push the boundaries further. But even in something like Midsummer Night's Dream, you have this um, superficially lighthearted comedy, right? Mm -hmm. It's about lovers. Shakespearean comedies um, always have this, this sort of mistaken identities, confusion, um, lovers, ultimately lovers getting married. Um, and there's always something that sort of seems to seep in or, or that you can find within this comedy that is not that lighthearted. And, um, and I think it's something that Shakespeare does kind of on purpose um, again, as a way to sort of open up the play, which is why I think the play remains so relevant. So for instance, some of the darker aspects within this particular comedy is, has to do with um, the sexual politics and violent background. Even at the beginning of the play, you, you've, um, we, can, we can see that Theseus has conquered Hippolyta as his bride. So it's not, it's not like Hippolyta wanted to be initially Theseus' bride. And he says in act one, scene one, um, Hippolyta, I wooed thee with my sword and won thy love doing thee injuries, but I will wed thee in another key with pomp, with triumph and with reveling. So if you wanna not unpack that, you can. You can do it sort of lightheartedly. Oh, you know, I, I wooed thee with my sword or you can really go into it Mm -hmm. And I just very recently watched a production by um, Russell C. Davis of the BBC 2016 with Matt Lucas as Bottom, um, which has John Hanna as Theseus and uh, Hippolyta is brought in in a sort of uh, wheeled in in those sort of um, carriages. It, it reminded me of um, Hannibal Lecter. So mm -hmm. she comes in and her there's a mouthpiece on her and she she is not allowed to speak wow. and her lines are fed to her like, oh, I'm so happy to be marrying you. So there's that sort of sexual violence and that is seen also in the very um, violent way in which Demetrius talks to Helena. He suggests that he threatens with rape in the woods. He says, you know, if you don't, if you don't get out of here, I'm gonna do mischief in the woods, which is sort of, and you can take it lightheartedly, but it also, there's a darker way in which you can take that. Um, the potential for tragedy is there at the very beginning, right? Which is, which is why um, it's so easy to understand sort of the other exercise in this type of um, dynamic 
with Romeo and Juliet, you also have in Midsummer Night's Dream a father, Aegeus, who wants his daughter Hermia to get married to the man he wants to marry. So, so he wants him, uh, her to marry, which is um, uh, Demetrius, not Lysander, who is really kind of the same, but just Aegeus wants this man, this Athenian gentleman, because he has chosen it. He's the father and the Athenian law um, backs him up with this. And Theseus actually tells Hermia, you have essentially three choices, right? Think about it, but you have three choices. You either marry Demetrius or you are sentenced to death or you can become a nun and sort of chant at the moment. Um, so it's, again, it's sort of quite problematic in that sense. And I'm not sure, do we look at these things when we're in high school? I don't. Oh, I'm we not definitely sure. did not. Definitely, definitely there was no. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's uh, there. It, I, I think there are so many parts that seem, yeah, there's this idea like, oh, it's, it's fairies. And so it's accessible in a certain way. But yeah, I mean, I think that those borders of accessibility and, um, and distance or, um, or even like, a, mm, I don't know, a, I don't want to say repulsion, but that, that there's sort of like a proximity and a, and a, and a push as well. Um, are constantly, I mean, it was one of the joys of revisiting it, that it's it's so much more complex. I mean, I find this is always true of Shakespeare, which is part of the reason why I find it very intimidating, um, that uh, it's hard to ever, um, it's perpetually dazzling and, and, and perpetually impossible to pin down. But I, I think that's part of what makes it so, so fascinating in terms of, in terms of like a living text that is interpreted through performances, that is interpreted through new, um, through new voices um, across, um, across media. Um, we talked, you talked a bit about the characters and um, I think too, to, to choose a protagonist is, uh, is difficult. Do you have thoughts on the protagonist issue or do you have a purely non-scholarly uh, preference for any of the characters? I mean, I think, I mean, again, it has to do with production. I'm always thinking of productions with this, with this play, which doesn't happen with, with, with many, I mean, with other plays. For instance, if you think I've, I've taught Coriolanus for a number of years and you have like two versions of Coriolanus, right? In, in film, I mean, two adaptations. With this, you have so many, it's so rich. And the fun part is to try and make it funny. And a lot of productions I've seen, I've, I've watched sort of um, in the globe, try to interest the audience in it. And in those types of productions, the mechanicals win hands down. Like if you have a really good bottom, um, he can make the play so, so fascinating and funny and, and a, a, tri a tribute to the art of acting, right? And, sort of, because um, the line there is, these are professional actors who are pretending they're non-professional actors. Um, and, and that sort of, that, that multi-level um, performance aspect is, I think makes it really wonderful. I love the fairies, but obviously the problem with the fairies is that you you're always have to have that extra uh, suspension of disbelief element you're like they're not actually walking they're supposed to be flying and so on so it's it it asks a lot and i think with with cgi technologies for for film um that becomes i guess a little bit more believable um there are especially in in romantic times um authors said that midsummer night's dream was an essentially non uh non-stageable play mm -hmm. because you just had to there was so much that was that was lit, that was sort of uh, for the imagination to fill in those gaps that you couldn't really um, you couldn't really pull it off. So I don't know. I like them all. I think, and and I like that the 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 dynamics, the the um, the pace, right? Because it's a play that mo that doesn't let you get bored mm -hmm. because it's it's right. It's short, but it also allows you to move into through all of these very complex worlds and somehow pull all the threads together so that you never feel like, like, oh, there's the, this has nothing to do with, or the mechanicals has nothing to do with the fairies. There are links, right? 
um, between all of the all of the different storylines, which I think is is quite fascinating and and brilliant. Um, yeah, I mean, it seems like even I hadn't thought about it in quite these terms, but even the un like the unstageability of of it is a part of that constantly pushing of boundaries. And I mean, to create an unstageable theatrical work in a time when props are minimal, when sets are uh, when sets are minimal, is just kind of daring. I mean, it, it does seem kind of perpetually daring to uh, an audience, like daring you not to uh, to kind of follow along, to get swept up in it in a, um, yeah. in, a, in a variety of ways. And two, I mean, I think also to return to the question of language, um, that you have these moments of intense lyricism that want to fully hold your attention, right? That like us as having it in print in front of us that you want to be able to sort of like shut the book for a moment and daydream. And, um, uh, but the pace, of the, the, the pace of the theater prevents that. So you have always this kind of push and pull of uh, attention and distraction, um, even by the beauty of it, there's the distraction possible. Um, and then you have the end sort of Puck barging in or being left, he's not barging in, he's left alone on stage and he's like actually, if you didn't like it, that's okay. If we shadows have offended, you know, don't don't worry about it. Pretend that it didn't happen, and that's okay. And it, it it's it's a little sad because you're like, I actually wanted to believe that these shadows were, was a real story, was a real um, world, and then you're you you're sort of brought down, uh, brought back down to earth, and you're like, actually, the, this is the skill of performance or the the magic of, of theatrical illusion, right? That it can sort of encompass all of your senses and make you believe in it. Yeah. Um, much as the aristocrats, right? Believe in, even, even if for a moment, they believe in the, the death of Pyramus and the, the grief of Thisbe. Yeah. Um, thinking about sort of the end and being let back out into the world reminds me of sort of the many experiences at the theater of like the moment when when the curtain falls and there's just that 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 moment of devastation that the world is uh that the veil is kind of closing between the two uh the two worlds um as you th in think in thinking about sort of Shakespeare or spectacle or just your own relationship with the theater are there any um what do you think of in terms of the, have you noticed what you miss the most this year or the, of, the, of, the, of the experience of going to the theater? Uh, so much, so much, but I guess, <laughs> I guess the being able to share with other people that excitement, there's an energy there, right? Mm -hmm. um, that I think when you go to a performance, the, the laughter the, or the, the emotion, right? The, the, the tension is, I think, something that is that is lost because you also have sort of you can pause to go bathroom break, snack break, whatever. You you don't get that sort of immersive experience. Um, so that's that's sad. At the same time, there's a sense perhaps of more accessibility. I mean, we have to to look at the at the good aspects, right? We wouldn't be having this conversation. Um, if if we were forced to have it live, probably right. So right. it's it's kind of wonderful yeah. at the same time in certain aspects. Um, yeah, I mean it, to frame it sort of in a more positive term. Um, when you envision the first performance that you go to in person uh, on the other side of this, um, is there a sense that comes to mind first? The sense that you're thinking of first in terms of that sort of entry. What comes to mind when you think of like what you're looking forward to? I think again, it has to do with the excitement in within the audience as a spectator. The 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 tuning of the instruments, for mm -hmm. instance, is something that you don't get if you're at home, sort of, because you it's either not recorded or you're not you're sort of getting ready. You're I don't know opening your popcorn whatever, but you're not you're not there when the when the cellists or or whoever is sort of tuning their instrument and and there's a sense of like it's gonna start and everyone I feel everyone is sort of happy nervous or happy excited right, 
Um, I think that's what I miss, a sense of it's, it's coming. You, can, you can't pause it because you're not in control in a sense. You're yeah. a participant, you're a real participant. So you, cha- you can't just sort of go, go away to the next room and come back when, you're, when you want to. Mm-hmm. Um, so that sense of being entrapped, I guess, in a good way, um, and Titania does that to, to bottom. Yeah, she said, she tells the fairies, please shut him up. Um, and, and, and so I can sort of uh, make love to him. Um, and, it's, and it's that sense of, of being um, put under the spell of the theater, yeah. whatever production you're watching or whatever genre you're watching that I think I miss the most. Yeah, I mean, it seems wonderful to be thinking about sort of what what it'll be like to to see theater again in general with the play that um, that places sort of the magic of spectacle in all its forms, right? Not just theatrical spectacle, but also performance of power, performance of love, performance of uh, relationship, a variety of different types of relationships, friendships, all these different types of relationships. Um, uh, what it means to perform those roles, like to think about that being on stage is so exciting. So um, anything else that you would, uh, that, 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 that is burning, uh, burning ideas about Midsummer Night's Dream to share? Uh, let me check to see if there's anything that I would have liked to discuss. I think we covered most of what I'm sort of, what I look at in the play. Uh, not sure. Do you have any any extra no. thoughts that you'd like to? No, look at? magical. I mean, it feels like I, I think it's helpful to think um, to think of Shakespeare always as an invitation. There's maybe that pressure of. I mean, in this extraordinarily literary season that we have uh, coming up in 2021, um, this is maybe the. I, I was thinking this morning that this was maybe the best known of all of the five works that are serve as source material for the operas. Um, and yet it's the least, it's the least possible to encapsulate in any, in any way. And, uh, and to think of that as an invitation for our own imagination rather than a limitation or like a restriction um, to think of this as, as an opening and, and everything you've shared has, has, has absolutely blown the doors open. <laughs> so I, there's, there's a lovely um, speech by Caleb and the monster in The Tempest, which I always feel is an invitation to Shakespeare in general. And he starts by saying, be not afeard. The aisle is full of noises, sounds and sweet airs that give delight and hurt not. That speech is such, I think, so liberating in the sense that, I mean, you can take Shakespeare, you can approach Shakespeare from whatever angle you want. There's so much that there's no right way to look at Shakespeare. That's, I think, quite liberating. That w- whatever is on stage, I find there's, there's, there's gonna be a justification in the text or there's gonna be a silence in the text that allows you to read it that way. Mm-hmm. So I, I feel that's quite liberating because you're, you're, not, you're not bound to be right um, about a uh, right reading, right? We also don't know what Shakespeare thought about anything, right. basically. So that's also, I mean, you can, you can take the text and the performance in whatever direction you want. And I think that's, that's what makes it I, hopefully less intimidating. <laughs> Francisca, thank you so much for your time and insights and for the invitation to liberation through Shakespeare. <laughs> Love it. Thank you so much, Jenny. This, this was really wonderful. Thank you.